too much to accept that message at face value. There's got to be more. We're not hearing what it's like. Well, Habonim should certainly invite whoever else they wish to give you the other side, but it's not my job to tell you what all people who don't like NIF say. But having said that, uh, I think you're reading only one side of what's out there to read about the New Israel Fund. Because I've seen it too. I've seen what NGO Monitor writes about the New Israel Fund, what Ian Tirtsu writes, and I can give you a point for point rebuttal about any of the things that you want to ask me about. But I will also say that I don't know if you read Yidiot Achronot last week, the leading Israeli daily newspaper, the largest circulation newspaper. And when the editorial board of Yidiot Achronot was asked who they would choose to light the Yom Ha'atzma'ut light in Israel for Yom Ha'atzma'ut this year, they chose the human and civil rights organizations in the New Israel Fund. So it really depends on who you read. You are absolutely right. There are folks uh, in the neocon and the right wing in Israel who think that New Israel Fund and not really New Israel Fund. It's really the human rights, civil rights, and religious pluralism organizations that we support are the answer to every question about what's wrong with Israel. But that's scapegoating. And it's mostly not true. Now, there are some areas of profound disagreement. We support the Arab uh, NGO sector in Israel. That is to say, the Arab-Israeli sector. Uh, NIF doesn't support any non-Israeli amuta or nonprofit organization. 100% of the money we send to Israel goes to Israeli organizations. They do not go to Palestinian organizations or Canadian organizations or American, just Israeli NGOs. Now, we support the Arab civil rights sector. That Arab civil rights sector represents one-fifth of the population of the state of Israel. I know that we are not going to, I am not going to agree with everything that they all think. Uh, and I know that their vision, many of the leaders of the Arab sector, and probably most Israeli Arabs, their vision of the country that they would like to live in is one where they feel that they are fully first-class citizens. And if you asked uh, the Arab-Israeli community, right, the 20% the, the of the population of the state of Israel, would you rather Israel be a Jewish democracy or a plain democracy? What do you think most of the Arabs would say? They would say, I'd rather it just be a democracy. Having said that, if you ask, would you rather live in Israel or any other place in the world? They would say, I'd rather live in Israel. And I'd like to work to realize Israel's founding vision. And, and they are definitely not going to sound like Zionists because they aren't Zionists. But Israel has 20% of its population that's Arab. Now, we could continue on the path that elements of the current government are going down, which is to further marginalize them and make them feel like second-class citizens and make them feel that they don't have a franchise in Israel, uh, to continue the inequitable allocation of resource. But I think that will create a civil war. I don't think there's any good end to it. So I believe that we have to support those Arab-Israeli voices who are challenging the status quo at the high court, who are challenged through totally legal means in Israel. Uh, now, that is not always popular, but we support it so long as those organizations are not working actively to destroy or end or terminate the Jewish character of the state of Israel. When they do that, uh, we say, gay is in the but we don't support you anymore. On the other end of the spectrum, we're the largest single supporter of what we call the liberal orthodox community. That is, orthodox and ultra-orthodox NGOs who are working to end the hegemonic monopoly of the state-sponsored rabbinate and religious establishment. Uh, I know, when I have coffee with them, that I really don't want to hear what they think about the rights of gay people and women and Arabs in Israeli society. But so long as they are not actively working to undermine the democratic side of the equation, right? Israel is a Jewish and democratic state, and they're doing great work working on, on uh, divorce equity rights or to desegregate Jerusalem city buses. We will support them in their good work. We don't have to agree with everything that all of our grantees do, but that is unacceptable to many people on both sides of the spectrum, and I accept it. That's who we are. And the most controversial aspects of NIF uh, in the last year have been the human rights organizations. And I want to give another example, because the one that we get most pilloried for supporting is an organization called B'Tselem. B'Tselem is the Israeli Human Rights Center. Now, interestingly, B'Tselem is big enough that they have not received a core grant from NIF for many, many years. B'Tselem was one of the organizations that reported on what happened in Operation Cast Lead, the war in Gaza. Uh, there was a, a, an absurd claim that NIF was responsible for, our grantees were responsible for 90% of the Goldstone Report's information. Excuse me? 92%. Now, if you're reading, even the Jerusalem Post, right, which is not editorially a great friend of NIF, thoroughly debunked the 92%. In fact, under 3% of the reportage uh, of, the, of the quotes in Goldstone came from NIF organizations. So that was an 89% discrepancy. 
that the group in Tertsu, which we can talk about later, uh, put forth. But it was a lie. It was a libel. It was a slander. Right? But the 3% that was included in Goldstone was information that I, as the CEO of NIF, am very proud that our grantees put forward. And so too was the IDF. And in July of last year, the Judge Advocate General of the IDF uh, had a press conference where he thanked Betselem and the other human rights organizations for their reportage from Gaza during the war, saying, even though these are truths that are sometimes difficult for us to hear, uh, we have now changed our operating procedures for warfare in urban spaces as a result of the reportage. And there have been several indictments of people who have been charged with uh, war crimes. But here's the deal, or sorry, violations of human rights. But here's the deal. Betselem took issue with Goldstone's conclusion that the IDF had intentionally targeted citizens. They said, that is not our reporting. Right? But this is not Amnesty or Human Rights Watch. This is an indigenous Israeli human rights group that said, uh, bad things happened and the IDF needs to police itself, but we vehemently disagree with the conclusion that the IDF targeted civilians. That's the group we su supported. That's what we got attacked for doing. And of course, last month, Judge Goldstone retracted his most controversial finding and agreed with Beth Selim. So, look, I know that an organization like ours that supports those who represent the voices of the least popular and the most marginalized that uh, represent those, that support those organizations that say painful truths about Israel, uh, but who do it through love of Israel, is going to be unpopular in some quarters. But I would urge you to expand your reading and read the Israeli newspapers, read Yidiot Achronot, read Haaretz, read those newspapers who editorialize that NIF is, as Isser said, uh, one of the saving graces of the state of Israel. Listen to Benny Begin, listen to Ruby Rivlin. You know, make your own judgments, but don't only read the one side. You know, no one's ever asked that question exactly as you just have asked it. And so that's one of the best questions I've ever been asked. Um, did people hear the, the question? Right. So uh, look, <laughs> the, the question was, w let's say Israel overnight turned into the country that NIF and its organizations want it to be and envision it to be. Uh, would the, the generational disassociation from Israel that is happening in my country somehow be reversed? Would these people find a way to re-engage? Is that a correct articulation? So look, I mean, my, the premise of my, um, of my call to you was that the work of trying to achieve that Israel is what will be compelling to young American Jews. You know, when we achieve it, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, look, I, all I can say is that in the long uh, experience of, of even just the history of the United States, not so long by comparison. Um, Martin Luther King came and said, uh, this is a vision of the United States, it's what we want to see. That work remains unfinished, but obviously two years ago it got a lot closer to fruition, no matter what you think about the president and his policies, the election of Barack Obama was a manifestation of that vision, and it was brought forth largely by uh, tens of millions of young Americans who embraced engagement uh, when they felt that they were on the verge of, of, of seeing it come to its fruition. I believe that uh, ultimately in Israel that doesn't force or doesn't seem to force people, let me not even say Israel, an American Jewish communal establishment that says that loving Israel, warts and all, is a perfectly fine way to love Israel. Um, I don't believe that the accomplishment of that vision is going to uh, make us all say, well, the horse is out of the barn, we're done, it's time to go to bed. But, but I'm also not sure, just very candidly, that if that really happened, whether that would be the worst thing that ever happened in the world. And Israel at peace with itself and its neighbors, a place that is, as Amos Oz once wrote, uh, a Hebrew-flavored Jewish Greek, Greece-like country living on the Mediterranean, I would hope that those young American Jews would say, I want to have a vacation there. Yeah. But it's a great question, I want to think about it more. Yeah. Sorry, there was a young man there, please. Um, so, I was wanted to ask, how um, committed is the New Zero Fund to um, supporting the kind of democratic and um, uh, national aspirations of uh, the people of Israel that's occupying in the West Bank and Gaza, um, especially considering that it is relatively clear that the degradation, the well, increasing rapid degradation of Israel's democratic character is moving in lockstep with the increasing um, brutality or coercive, coercive nature of the occupation of Palestine? So uh, NIF has been on the record for a very long time as opposing the occupation, or I should say the settlement enterprise, and as supporting a two-state solution. And it is, uh, I think, part of the analysis of, of really most people who look at the situation, even those who think that the occupation is a necessary evil, 
uh, to those who think it is a, an evil that can no, must lo, no longer be necessary. Um, and then, of course, there are people who are supportive of it, but let's leave that group aside for a second because, frankly, that group's never going to give the New Israel Fund any support. But uh, of that large group, which, which accounts, incidentally, for the vast majority of Israelis, right, the vast majority of Israelis, who, I mean, in every poll, uh, the vast majority of Israelis say, I, we would like a two-state solution, we would like to get out of the settlements. It's that there is an, uh, the, the route to getting there for Israelis seems very, very unclear. Same is true of the American Jewish community. Uh, so I believe that um, the, the settlement enterprise and the occupation and the situation that Israel finds itself in is at the core of the internal Israeli challenge to democracy. Um, you know, the writer Gershom Gorenberg uh, says that he talks to his, he's an Israeli, I mean, he's American, but he made all the eyes, he's in Israel. And he wrote a fabulous book, which you should read, uh, called The Accidental Empire. And The Accidental Empire, incidentally, is about the way in which the settlement enterprise in the West Bank uh, and Gaza was not, as some of us imagine, the product of the right-wing Likud government, but rather something that came up under successive labor governments uh, for, for many, many years. And in fact, Gorenberg says, and look who it was who was the first person to actually physically uproot the, the settlement uh, enterprise from Gaza it was the architect of it, Ariel Sharon, who arrived at the same conclusion that every single prime minister since Rabin, and the open question is whether the current uh, prime minister feels that way, but every other prime minister has come to the conclusion that Ben-Gurion's triangle is, we, have a white, we don't have a whiteboard, we have, a, we have, a, we have an Arona Kodesh, oops. Uh, so so Ben-Gurion in 1967 comes out of semi-retirement at Kibbutz De Boker in the south of Israel to say, to sound the most discordant note in Israel. Israel is euphoric after the, uh, the Six-Day War uh, for good reason, and they just occupied territory that has made them three times bigger than they were, and Ben-Gurion, Dafka, Ben-Gurion of all people, says Israel now is defined by three points. We have uh, all this land, we're a democracy, and we're a Jewish state, but we can't have all three, says David Ben-Gurion. He says, we have to pick two. We can keep all the land and be a democracy, but we will be voted into Palestine eventually. Or we can keep the land and be a Jewish state, but then we really will be the thing that, uh, that so many people are afraid we will be. Uh, we will be an apartheid state. Or we can get rid of the land uh, and we can be a Jewish state and a democracy. And the funny thing is, it's not funny, right? Well, the, the, the bitter thing is, is that Israel has tried to balance those three, again, for whatever reasons, good reasons, bad reasons, external reasons, for 44 years. And the problem is the simple logic that Ben-Gurion stated has not changed. And that's why, again, everyone, right, center, and left, who has become prime minister of Israel in the last 15 or 20 years has concluded uh, thusly. So yes, I do think that at the core of many of the challenges that Israel faces uh, is the pernicious uh, ramifications of this 44-year-old occupation. But I don't think that's the only issue. And to paraphrase this gentleman's question, the day that the occupation ends and that Israel gets out, right? Uh, it's going to face all of the problems that I mentioned before in terms of gaps, but it can deal with those problems. I firmly believe that it can. But the occupation, um, look, you know, this is again something that angers people when we say it. Um, it is not the only problem that Israel faces, but it is the first and biggest problem that Israel faces right now. I wondered if you could address how we, we talk amongst non Jews who care about this and who are on the left. Well, uh, first of all, let me say, Jimmy Carter, in that book, said a lot of things I don't agree with, but he didn't, but just to be clear, I feel as the only American in the room, or one of the Americans, I have to say, that uh, they're one of the many United States citizens in the room, uh, that, that Carter's book, which was called uh, Palestine, colon, Peace, Not Apartheid, uh, he was referring to the occupied territories. Now, uh, I lost a coin flip among three of my friends, and it was an unfair coin flip, because one of them was the head of Jewish studies at UCLA, and one of them was the head of Jewish studies at the University of California, Davis, but I lost the three-way coin toss, so I was the one who they picked to read the book, and it was not an easy book, and it was a hard slog, and all I have to say about it is Dennis Ross was angry at Carter because Carter misrepresented Ross's maps, and when you piss off Dennis Ross, then you've gone too far, but, but he was not the one who said that Israel should be referred to as an apartheid state, um, but I've heard, of course, um, about Israel Apartheid Week in Canada. We have it uh, also in the States, and, and, and as to the heart of your question, look, I think that, that the liberal Jewish community uh, has made a huge strategic error, right? Um, 
Abba Ibn once said, Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Recently, uh, a major Israeli thinker said, look, we, the Israelis, never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. But I would like to say that we, those of us who are liberal Jews uh, and progressive Zionists, we also never miss that opportunity. And one of our missed opportunities is, is the one that you're commenting on. My, our co-religionists to the far right and, uh, and Christians to the far right in my country, in the United States, are pouring money into the settlement enterprise. The New York Times estimated up to a quarter of a billion dollars a year into the settlement enterprise. They're pouring money. Most of the money is now from fundamentalist dispensationalist Christians, right? On the hard left, uh, you have organizations, there's one in the States called Sabil. Uh, they, they come, they come uh, and talk about, talking about justice for you know, Palestine and for Israel and Palestine, but really their message is one that is, that is aimed at delegitimizing Israel's uh, right to exist as a, as a Jewish state as it characterizes itself in the Middle East. Meanwhile, the moderate liberal sort of majority right, has never thought to reach out to the moderate Christian liberal majority, which at least in the States agrees with the US Jewish community on like 90% of the agenda on gay rights, on women's rights, on the environment, on the social contract, on gun control, on abortion. There's like total agreement between these communities. But when it comes to Israel, the only time we engage with them uh, and again, I'm taking this as a sin for my movement. Uh, every few years, the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, which is a more centrist organization in the States, would call me up and they would say, would you come with us to meet with the Presbyterian uh, or Episcopal leadership in such and such a city? Because we want to show them that the Zionist American movement, left, right, and center, stands united against uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And so I would go, and, and I certainly did have credibility with some of these folks. Well, if the liberal guys are against it, then we have to reconsider our church's decision to divest from Israel. And it never occurred to me, right, until relatively recently, that there might be more to that relationship than telling them not to divest, that we might want to say, your vision of a holy land, right, of an Israel where, where uh, prophetic values are, are, are realized where Jew and Arab and Christian and Muslim live side by side and in peace. That's our vision too. And the vehicle that you could use to get that vision uh, realized could be the same ones that we use. We never did it. But New Israel Fund is going uh, after those people. And I'm actually meeting in a couple of weeks with the head of the Episcopal Church in Los Angeles and in New York to make the argument that they should be supporting the New Israel Fund. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll add to that, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, you, you raised critiques that have been made of, of New Israel Fund, and one of the ways that it's very effective to, uh, to counter that, I believe, is again by saying, look, that's a set of opinions, there's another set of opinions, but it's also to find the knowledgeable people who understand the issues and understand the organizations who are willing to speak out. And uh, in Israel, we've been incredibly fortunate to find those kinds of people. Uh, and we have people uh, like Bernard Avishai, and Moshe Halbertal, perhaps Israel's leading public intellectual, and Ruth Gavison, who just won the Israel Prize. Uh, and we have, uh, as I said, the editorial boards of Haaretz and Idi Otachrenot, and ministers like Begin and Rivlin. So we have these validators, right? And in the US, we have Tom Friedman and Paul Krugman and David Remnick, who, who uh, are supportive of NIF and our vision. But we haven't gone into the Christian world, and so it's with a great amount of drama, I can tell you that uh, the efforts to to find these validators of this vision took a big quantum leap for us, not due to our own efforts, uh, because I'm leaving early tomorrow morning from your beautiful city to go to Washington because uh, uh, I'm meeting at the White House with the president and a number of other Jewish leaders in the president's uh, desire to signal uh, that he sees uh, a different kind of American Jewish leadership emerging that he wants to work in partnership with. Now, I understand that for those on the hard right, that will just confirm everything they thought about Barack Obama. But for the 80% of American Jews who voted for him, most of whom will vote for him again, this is important. So this notion that we should seek uh, friends way beyond small rooms in liberal cities uh, is one that resonates greatly with me. half a million Palestinians will start walking from Gaza in the direction of Tel Aviv and saying we want our homes and we want to return and we don't care about anything. What should, in your opinion, Israel do to satisfy the liberal views of America? Well, first of all, uh, the reason I didn't answer yesterday, is, as I said earlier, was that I, ha I hadn't even heard the news or read it until one of the board members told me about it. And it was only 
after I got to my hotel room, because you Canadians may be nice and polite, but you work your visiting guests very hard, uh, late at night that I was able to read uh, the Times and the Aretz and Idiot and, and read about what happened. Look, you know, as I've made clear, uh, the New Israel Fund is not APAC, it's not J Street, it's not the Zionist Organization of America. That is to say, it is not an advocacy organization that promotes a particular view of Israel's role vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors. As I said, we're about an Israel that's at peace with itself, not an Israel that's at peace with its neighbors. There are groups left, right, and center that are working on that. So the pshat, right, the simple uh, answer to your question is, we don't take positions on Israeli foreign policy issues, nor can we, nor would you ask the guy who runs you know, the battered women's shelter, or the woman who runs the battered women's shelter, or the environmental defense group, what they think about that. Look, as a private citizen, I don't think Israel has to do anything to satisfy liberal Americans uh, because they're liberal. Uh, I think Israel needs to do things both to ensure its security and its survival, and it needs to do things to secure that it has uh, consistency with its founding values. If it chooses not to do the latter, that's its prerogative. But I then believe it will lose quickly and radically uh, the support of the American Jewish community and the United States. And that's something that I don't think Israel can do. Uh, Martin Indyk, who was board member of the New Israel Fund and who was twice the uh, ambassador of the United States to Israel uh, under both President Clinton and President Bush, uh, was asked on Army Radio last year um, uh, a question about that was not dissimilar to yours, not the 500,000 people from Gaza, right? But rather, you know, uh, why should, essentially, do we have to listen to what your administration wants us to do? Why should we? And Indyk said, look, if you're a superpower and you don't need the support and friendship of the United States of America, then you can do what you want to do. You can act totally independently without regard for our political, foreign policy, or domestic concerns. That's your prerogative. And the chips will fall depending on your actions. However, if you are not, and if you need the friendship and partnership of the United States of America, you need to take our political, domestic, and foreign policy concerns into consideration every, but every bit as much as we take yours into consideration when we move. So I don't think Israel has to do anything to satisfy liberal Americans. I think if Israel wants to survive, it has to act as a liberal democracy in the family of nations. As for uh, the, the, the nightmare scenario that you, that you describe, uh, look, Thomas Friedman, of all people, was speaking for a new Israel Fund event uh, two weeks ago. And he said, and he's written this, he's a, sort of America's leading columnist in the New York Times on, on Middle East affairs. He was very much in favor of the war in Iraq um, from this position for a while until he wasn't, right? But, but he argued, um, and I thought it was an interesting argument. He said, look, the story that is happening in the Arab world right now, the Arab Spring, uh, first of all, is not going to end until it's affected every Arab country one way or the other. And he said the Palestinian reconciliation, which is, may or may not be happening now, we don't really know, obviously, whether that's going to stick, is the product of this Arab Spring. It's the product of Hamas losing its terror sponsors in Syria, and Fatah seeing what's happening in Tunis and Egypt, uh, and, and, and worrying about what's going to happen, so they've got to make some kind of a move. And he said that Israel may or may not have a real partner for peace. But Israel right now, he said, if I were advising the Prime Minister, he said, Israel ought to take the big risk right now when it's got the backing of the United States to do it and make the big risk and, and take, you know, move, make the offer. Because he said, you have to get the hell out of their story, right? The Arab story right now is really going out of control. And for Israel's own security, it should get the hell out of that story, get out of the territories, either as sure, look, you know, either unilaterally or not. Yes, unilateral withdrawal from Gaza was a failure in some respects. But you know, in other respects, it probably wasn't a failure. But anyway, he said, get out of the territories, get out of their story. So I think that obviously, this is again, as a private citizen, that if I were advising the Israelis what to do, which is what you asked, I would say, take the big risk right now. But that's not my job, that's just my opinion. That wasn't my question. Well, I, I'm trying to answer your question. We don't, so there aren't groups that are, that are working, NIF doesn't support groups involved in propaganda or PR wars outside of Israel. But tell them only, not only, but some focuses on war crimes committed by Israelis. Yes. Yes. Where are the right. groups that NIF stands within yes. Israel that represent Palestinians who are against the war crimes committed by other Palestinians? Where are the groups that stand up for the women being subjugated by their own people? Where are these groups that want education that promotes a coexistence with Arab communities, with Jews, with Israelis and Palestinians within Israel? Well, first of all, we support... 
We support many of those organizations. Uh, the women's rights and a lot of the Arab rights organizations we support are working on behalf of Arab women who are discriminated against. Uh, one of our projects which we support, we co-support with the United States State Department in Lakia and the Negev is about uh, economic empowerment for Bedouin women. If you're asking us, does NIF support Palestinian organizations that are monitoring Palestinians, or for that matter, Jewish organizations that are monitoring Palestinians, we don't support, I told you, we only support Israeli organizations that are working in our four areas. The human rights organizations in Israel, like the ones in Canada, right, are not there to promote a narrative. I understand that we may disagree about that. They're not, Beth Selim does not exist to tell a bad story about Israel in order to win political points or to convince people that they shouldn't love or support Israel. B'Tselem is an Israeli human rights organization that says when Israel acts in a way that is not in, uh, in harmony with its values, with its laws, with its uh, military rules, we have to report on it. And that, they're no different from, I'm sure you have Canadian organizations that are safeguarding the rights of the Inuit, right? Uh, and other organizations. That's the kind of organization that NIF supports in Israel. We don't find it, uh, we don't support NGOs, and there are plenty of them in Israel, who are trying to tell one side of the story for political points. Half a million went to an organization called Abdallah, Abdallah. Abdallah, I spoke about them earlier, yeah. And then I just remembered that there is a couple of people, Hugh Beda and Adam Shapiro, part of, it's called a international solidarity movement. It's kind of Arabs and Jews turning Arabs bent on destroying Israel. Absolutely unequivocally. And I just thought, they are the main friends with this Abdal, or whatever the name is. And I just thought to myself, wow. New Israel Fund, lesson Mr. Sotkach. And then I heard today a little phrase who said Russian and stuff like that, like the right wing. I was quoting Yosef Alfred talking about right wing Russian parties like I Israel Batanga. I come from Russian Jews. He, he, I don't think he meant it as a, as a monolithic well, description of the entire community. I appreciate it. But deep inside, I have an inner feeling of protection of Israel. God forbid a hair falls off Israel. Why? Our parents, when they left, they said, sleep the kingdom which means, if anyone knows Yiddish, for the future of the children. And I just thought, this Arab neighbors bent on destroying Israel are being donated money by American Jews. And Canadians. Sorry. And I think, why are you guys giving to Abdallah? So there are so Yiddish kinder, there are Jewish children all over Israel. Give it to them, let them be democratic. In any way you wish. So why would you give one thing? Let me try to answer to your someone that wants to be bad to my brothers, to Jewish children. Okay, um, if we could ask you to let I get the question. The question, question done. Thank you for your question. So Adala, as I said earlier, is one of the most contentious issues uh, organizations for a lot of people. They are Israel's leading Arab civil rights organization. I have never heard before. Uh, any connection with the International Solidarity Movement, which is not an Israeli organization. If it were, it wouldn't be one that we support. How, how, I don't believe that is an accurate characterization of the relationship between the organizations. Um, Adala represents Arabs and Arab issues at the high court of the state of Israel. I don't agree with everything their leadership says or does. They don't protest in the occupied territories. They're not part of the International Solidarity Movement. They represent Arab civil rights claims at the high court of the state of Israel, and they often win, right? They often win. Uh, if you want to find an organization that is going to only support the Jewish aspect of Israel, then NIF is not for you. NIF is about a Jewish and democratic Israel, and that means supporting Israel's right to exist as a I Jewish... Your mind. Excuse me, <laughs> maybe you could. Uh, yeah. to, to, to support Israel's right to exist as a Jewish homeland, that is also an open and free and equal society for all of its citizens. And I began the talk by saying, I understand that there's a real tension there, but it's a tension that the founders of Israel, the framers of its Declaration of Independence, uh, wrestled with, and it's no less than we can do to wrestle with it. But it's true, and I have not good, I mean, it will always be on the cutting edge of wrestling with the most challenging issues that Israel faces. But I will tell you this, if you, not you, if one says that the 20% of the state of Israel that's Arab, 
that is a second-class citizenry. They have no real home or place in the state of Israel. Their narrative has to be silenced. The human rights violations against them have to be ignored. Then that's a recipe for civil war at worst or ethnic cleansing at best. Neither one is an answer, and I thank God that there has never been a government of Israel who has even come close to following down that path. Well, the interesting thing about the era in which we live, of course, is that anybody sitting at home with a laptop, or for that matter, an iPhone, uh, is a constituency and can put opinion out. And if you're good, and if you're compelling or funny or interesting, then people will read you. So uh, to paraphrase you, that, that horse has left the barn, right? There, there, there's, there's no control on information, and, um, and anyone who thinks there is, is, you know, is, is, is engaging in a Hosni Mubarak level of delusion about changing circumstances. So, uh, look, I don't know what the situation is in Canada. I, of course, have been told that the Canadian, and I can see that the Canadian Jewish community is different, uh, just as we have a UK affiliate, an Australian affiliate. Um, they're very different Jewish communities from the US. This is not a problem in the US. Uh, there's a very different, not only Jewish press, but a very different blogosphere, which is equally represented left, right, and center. And I will, you know, I will tell you that um, the harshest criticism of New Israel Fund in the United States comes from the hard left. Uh, and, and not from the hard right. Um, so in, ter in terms of advice, I'm not sure what to say, except what I, what I, what I said in, in response to your question, which is that I hope that people who are looking for the other alternatives uh, will look beyond just what they're finding in the first Google web search of New Israel Fund. Because uh, the information that partisan organizations, and for that matter, don't take New Israel Fund's word for it. Right? Don't just go to our website and NGO Monitor's website or Interior 2's website and think that you understand the situation. Go look at Haaretz at the editorial page. Go look at Yidiyot Achronot. Yidiyot Achronot is hard left? I just don't know how to respond to that. Um, so I, I, guess, I guess I think that to be an informed, to, to, to be an informed citizen or an informed Jew in the world, uh, we all have to take responsibility to get information from lots of sources and make our own decisions. I know that's not a great answer, but because I don't know the landscape of your media world, I'm not sure what alternatives there are. In the States, read the Forward, read the New York Jewish Week, read the LA Jewish Journal, read the San Francisco J. They represent all kinds of diverse opinion. I'm trying to get a grip on what it is at this point, since it's kind of moved over the course of the way this conversation has moved. Um, I guess I need to say, first of all, that Israel, New Israel Fund speaks to me totally. Resonated from day one because I'm exactly one of those people who is, by my upbringing as a Jew, I've been taught to care about social justice issues. So I'm automatically in that camp and then I see things, Israel representing things that don't square with that. And so I've been alienated from my love of Israel and my caring about Israel, and then also I get totally alienated on the left because of what's been happening there. And so the is New Israel Fund is like a beacon, and I'm just shocked that I come to this meeting and it doesn't feel safe, and I, that's what's kept me disengaged. So I'm nine years older than you are. It's not just the youth that's disengaging from Israel. I disengaged from everything because there's no safe spot either in left politics or in the Jewish community and especially in Canada and I grew up in the United States and I've now lived half and half my life in Canada and and you, I think you've got a pretty accurate case and I guess my question is um, I don't have nearly as much as I'd like to to do that. 
So I think we need really concrete, like I think the indoctrination that I got to create that tie with Israel as a child has to be the answer now if right. religious schools are not believing that. Well for, first of all I just I wanna state that um, the question, oh, I'm going to summarize the question as being, uh, how do you go about and try to affect the kind of positive engagement with young people, middle-aged people, all kinds of people, for people who feel that they are disillusioned? Um, how do you do it when it doesn't feel that there are the kinds of safe spaces or, for that matter, the kinds of effective vehicles beyond writing a check to do it? First thing I want to say is, I don't think that you, now that I'm 43, I do not believe that you were middle-aged. I believe you were very young. Uh, so, uh, look, I, you know, when I came to New Israel Fund, one of the examples that I took with me was an organization called the American Jewish World Service. For those of you who don't know AJWS, they're an organization run by the great Ruth Messenger. Uh, the best thing that ever happened to the Jewish community is that she lost to Rudy Giuliani uh, in, the, in the, the mayoral election in New York City. She went, and went to the American Jewish World Service and took a moribund old organization that was meant to send Jewish dollars to developing countries, sort of almost the Jewish uh, USAID or whatever the Canadian equivalent would be, yeah. thank you, or Catholic Relief, and she turned it into a vehicle to engage a generation of young Jews in uh, deeply Jewishly mobilized, or mo motivated mobilization to go to the developing world. She turned it into a Jewish Peace Corps. So one thing that we uh, have already begun to do this year, working with Maase Olam, Israel's leading service learning center, is that we are recruiting our first class of 40, uh, it's gonna start in the US, uh, young Jews to go do a term of service. Are we doing it here in Canada too? Fantastic, we're doing it in Canada too, I've been told. Uh, to go do a term of uh, community service work uh, in Israel, uh, working on social justice issues and working with a cohort of other people to have this kind of positive but also realistic engagement with Israel and real Israelis working to change Israel for the better. I know that's small bore, but that's the first kind of step towards that positive engagement. As for the safe space issue, look, again, I can't be, speak to Canada, um, but to my mind, we all need to have more spaces like this one. Um, and, and I say this with great, obviously, great affection for my new friend, the supporter of NIF. Um, but I think also, for better or for worse, it's time to be thick-skinned in the Jewish community. And if we don't want to be shouted at sometimes and told that we're wolves in sheep's clothing, uh, not that you said it, you said you'd read it. Um, there you go. So if you, can't, if, if, if you don't want someone to tell you, um, I disagree with you, I mean, I would like it to just be, I disagree with you as the gentleman behind you did, right? Um, but if you want people to, people call you names, they call you names. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm not sure how else to, 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 to advise you. Um, I wanna categor ca categorically say that you may think I'm a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, uh, and I do not think that you are a bully, but I think that the attitude that you are representing is often used to bully people and to frighten them. You, know, you call people names, you scream at them, you raise your voice, you yell, you say you're a wolf, and what's that? Self-hating Yeah, self-hating Jew, you're a traitor, you're this. Um, you know, there's a, there's a website, it's a Kachist website, that is, it's a Merkahanaist website called Self-Hating Israel Traitors Group. Get it, the shit, right, right? And it's a joke, to, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very funny now. You know who's on the shit list? The President of the State of Israel, the current Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the State of Israel, me, the past, Chief Justice of the State of Israel, the guy who runs J Street, uh, the President of the United States of America, the Secretary of State of the United States of America. Look, if everybody who disagrees with the hard line about Israel or, or for any other, you know, any, on any other issue, if we're all willing to be intimidated because people call us names and question our loyalty and tell us that we don't have our right to our opinion, then we may as well go home. But the great news is we're not going home. We love Israel, we are Zionists, and the truth is our uh, love of and vision for Israel is just as valid as anyone else's, and there is no monopoly on how you can love and support Israel, and the New Israel Fund, for many of you, is absolutely a way to do that. So thank you all very much. Just, just before we uh, close with, uh, just before we close with Dick, but once again, I want to thank uh, uh, Daniel Sokach and Dr. Isra Dubinsky mm -hmm. and Jay Broadford organized tonight's event. It was certainly stimulating, and we heard a lot of diverse opinions. 